Welcome everyone to Mountain Travel Symposium's third installment of our COVID-19 webinar series. I am Kat Shaw, the Director of Marketing and Content for MTS, and I'll be your host today. Before we get started, I want to go over some housekeeping notes for those who have not joined us before. You'll see a Q&A box and make sure that you submit all questions that you have in the Q&A box, not in the chat box. Uh, we'll be monitoring the Q&A box throughout the webinar, so um, submit questions there versus in the chat box. Uh, we also have um, a survey that will come up at the end of the webinar, so make sure you take the survey in order to give us your feedback on the content. And then also this is being recorded, so you will have the opportunity to uh, see the slides and, and share this presentation with your colleagues. It'll be available on the MTS website. So with that, I would like to introduce our presenters and our topic for today. Today's webinar, we're joined by our friends at Adara, Bill O'Brider, the Director of Tourism and Hospitality, uh, and Ted Sullivan, the Vice President of Destination, Destination Analytics. So we are going to be talking about data today. Uh, Today's webinar is called To Ski or Not to Ski, Tis Nobler to Use Data to Understand What the Mountain Traveler Will Do Next. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ted. Thank you, Kat. All right. All right, let me get started. Um, I'm very happy to be with my mountain travel friends again. The last time I was with you all was in Crans, Montana. And that was incredible. And unfortunately, we're not all together now, but hopefully again soon. Um, so let's let's get going to ski or not to ski. First, I just want to start with this graphic because I think it's really, really cool. So there we are. Um, I want to let you all know that, yes, we're going to be talking about data today. It is not going to be a bunch of these graphs. You're going to see a few of these because obviously, you know, stuff's down. We do want to talk about optimism and some of the trends we're seeing and how to uh, get out there and uh, what these trends mean and how to better market to the potential mountain traveler. I see this as an opportunity. Uh, I've been in the travel and tourism industry for 25 years from my uh, time at DMO and my time with an agency and with Adara. And the knock on our travel and tourism industry was always that we were not an essential, you know, uh, thing for human beings. We were not air, food, shelter, or water. But now after all these quarantines and everything else, I think that's going to change. We are, we realize how essential travel and being with others is. And I think that's our opportunity in this industry to take advantage of it. Uh, that's my really bad graphic to show that um, travel is also going to be part of the fifth element. And just to show you, I'm going to, you guys will see how much this might just induce a sense of just, you know, isn't that awesome? I mean, how, how, how mundane was that before? And now it just looks spectacular to all of us. I could let it go for a while, but we've, we've got some time. Um, so here's our agenda. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about why we should even uh, look at the data and, and why we should change. Uh, then we'll get specifically into what. So Bill O'Brider has pulled um, a, a lot of data over certain ski regions that he's going to share with you. And then we're going to have uh, about a half hour of uh, Q&A with chat with Kat. So main thing I want you to think about is if you don't measure it, you can't improve it. After this is really over and we all go back to market and we are starting to do things, there's going to be a lot of pressure on us because there's everyone needs travel back and we need to measure what we do and justify all of our efforts, not just to get by, but to hopefully get budget increases and increase travel in our areas. So we need to measure it. And as travel and tourism industry, we all know we need to get better at our measurement. And we're gonna give you some ideas on how to do that moving forward. So I wanna get into why. All the webinars I've been on and all the meetings I've been in, everyone always asks when, you know, when are we gonna go back to market? Where, what markets are we gonna to go to and what? What kind of messaging do I get out there? What kind of, what do I say? What kind of creative executions do I do? I don't want, I wanna be sensitive, but I also wanna say this, totally understood. So let's remind ourselves why we need to use data and why we need to get better. I like to say this, all right, now, Right now, everybody's being sensitive on how we market. We are, we, we, we don't know what to say and when to say it, and we wanna do the right thing. Give you an example. After the Great Depression, 
there were two cereal companies in the United States. Post was the bigger one, Raisin and uh, Kellogg's was the small. After the Great Depression, Post kept it easy. They're like, you know what? Let's be sensitive. Let's just keep doing the same things we're doing. Kellogg's did the exact opposite. They tripled their marketing budget and they bought a new medium called radio. And that's when they launched Snap, Crackle and Pop, Rice Krispies. They gained so much market share, they became five times the size of Post. That was just a, a way to do it. I'm not saying all of us need to do it, but I think it's a great example to remind ourselves there are opportunities during this time. Now, when we get better, there's the debate of research versus marketing. I'm a marketer and I constantly butt heads with my researcher because I'm trying to do something marketing wise, research wants to measure it, vice versa. They're trying to measure stuff and then I'm, you know, marketing does their own thing. As we move forward, research and marketing need to end that debate and use data to help drive the marketing decisions, all right? It was a debate, I'll give you an example. 25 years ago, uh, I was in the industry just starting off as a kid in my 20s. This is my friend, Rob. And Rob and I worked in an agency together and we traveled around and before, well, we were both single, we used to have this thing that we used to say is like, hey, what happens on the road stays on the road because we were in our 20s and we were idiots. So we used to say that. He then got a job in Vegas three years later and he called me and said, hey, Sully, you know that slogan we used to say, what happens on the road stays on the road? I'm like, yeah. He said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that for some of Vegas's marketing and advertising. And so I'm going to say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. He says, my research department hates it. They don't want me to do it. They want to focus on family, but I'm going to do it anyway. He did it anyway, and it became a global brand. All right. Now that doesn't happen all the time, but I love New York. No real research behind that. An agency came up with I love New York, global brand. Pure Michigan. Pure Michigan came up with when they were on a retreat, the agency and the state tourism office were on a retreat and came up with Pure Michigan, not with research, a retreat. Now, others might say that they stole it from Pure New Zealand, but you know, that, that's to be debated. There's also some marketing out there that should have been caught by research. This is terrible. I take a sheet in the pool. A, a researcher would have caught that. Or this, nothing sucks like an Electrolux. A good researcher would have caught that and marketing wouldn't have let that get out the door. And this, yes. Um, somebody in research should have caught that before that got out there. So that, that's some marketing that should be approved by research. And we take it a little closer to home. This was Rhode Island's campaign a few years ago. Rhode Island, cooler and warmer. I don't know what that is, uh, but that was their campaign. It was so bad that it made 60 minutes. Uh, the director resigned and the agency got fired. And the agency was the same agency that did I Love New York. So when we get out of this, we're all gonna be trying to market. And all of us wanna say stuff about mountain travel for skiing, for families, for fall time, that. Well, this is an ad. What does this have in common right here? Think about it. Roulette, horseback riding, BB King, fall leaves this. Well, what do they all have in common? I don't know, this ad. So when you don't know what to resonate, you don't use data to actually find out what gets people to come to your mountains or your destination, you look like this, everything to everybody. This was Arkansas. Point being, this is why we need to use data to really target. If we don't, your stuff could all be safe. Everything can look the same. These are four different hotel rooms in four different continents. All I did was remove the hotel logo and you can't even tell where we are. There, how many, how many times you see that ad, right? Who looks that happy carrying that much crap? I don't know, these are what the ads look like. I went, said spa, mountain spa. This is what I got when I got Google image search back, rocks on the back. This one I just Googled uh, luxury travel. What's luxury travel? All the ads were champagne on a plane. We're not even gonna see that anymore, but that's what the ads are. And I did family mountain travel yesterday. When I Googled that, these are the ads, I, the images that pulled up. Families with their arms in the air on top of a mountain, which is nice, but they all kind of look the same and not every one of these resonates with our travelers. So when we do this, when you see this, when you start doing your ads, you have to ask yourself, are we swimming in the sea of sameness? Think of the ads that are out there now saying like, hey, we're, we're still here for you when you come back and there's hope and that. They're great ads, but after a while, a lot of them all kind of sound the same and look the same. We need to start changing that and do the pivot. Let's look at APAC right here. If you took away the logos, it looks the same. When you add them, now you know where you are. That's not everyone, everyone's guilty. This is Europe. The Northern Lights are huge up in Scandinavia, but if I remove the logos, you don't know where you are. Finland, Norway, Sweden, Iceland. And we're guilty too. 
So mountain travel, I remove the logos from these four different ski destinations. When you add them, then you can finally see the difference. Point is, be yourself, everyone is taking. Right now, we're gonna be really judged on how sensitive we are, how aggressive we are, and how we resonate with potential mountain travelers and how we get them to come back to the mountains. We see this as an opportunity. I mean, right away, they're wearing masks and gloves. That's great. Um, they're gonna be outdoors. Uh, people are gonna be going different places. It's a huge opportunity to use data to get there. So what is that data? Talk to you about what Adara data is. So Adara, we have the data from over 270 global brands. So this is the, the data from hotels, flights. We also have open table data. So we're restaurants, which is very important. Live Nation, which are concerts, rental cars, a number of different brands. Total amount, just to give, it, give you some context, we've seen almost a billion travelers a month. That's a lot of travelers and a lot of transactions that we're able to look at. And when you look at the data, there's, it's more to it than just like a name and address. We know where they're coming from. We know exactly where they're going. If they search mountains and search beaches, we can tell you that. So you can tell where you might potentially be losing people, where and when they book. If you, we decide to put a pixel on either your website or your media, we can see if it resulted in a, in a, to an actual hotel reservation or a flight reservation and the hotel rate. So the ADR, we have all of that information within the data that Bill's getting ready to show you. So I'm gonna take a look at what we found. This is a keynote I was gonna give at ITB in Berlin in March, right before the travel. I thought it'd be interesting to show you just a few quick global data trends that Adara saw and how those things have probably changed over the past just three or four months. Looked at the world and everyone always wants to know what's going on in China. In China, we found out that, yes, they search and book their hotel, their flights in China, you have to, but they were doing a lot of their hotel bookings when they got in market to avoid the servers, we found out. So that way they would search, make sure there's ability, availability. When they got in market, then they would book their hotel. Package tours and accommodations, length of stay are on the rise. I don't know how much that's gonna change now that, that, that uh, once things open up. Take a look at India. India is a growing market that a lot of people are marketing to. And I always get asked, well, what's going on with India? So we pulled a year's worth of data of India and we found out this. They are the longest flight length of stay globally into Europe, North America, and APAC. So that means when they book a flight, it's about a month when they go to a destination instead. Contrast, you know, if you really look at it conversely, they are not in the top 25 cities for staying in hotels. So when they go there, when they go to, a, they stay with friends and family. They travel for social status more than experience, and they travel to relax more than a good time, which is very important if you're looking at mountain travel. Took a look at North America, and here's what I think is really gonna be different. When we did this in March, found out that Americans and Canadians will see more second city travel more than 2020. They're not gonna be going to the big cities. They're gonna be going to other cities, second and third cities. I think that's even gonna increase more now. I don't think the Americans are gonna be traveling to the bigger cities. I think they're gonna be going more to the countryside and the mountain towns. Americans are gonna take it slow-mo back in March, that I think is going to stop. I think it's going to be much more adventure travel than relaxation travel. They take the long time to plan and book, but it's shortening every single month. So the Americans are getting much more efficient in that. Finally, let's look at the Middle East. Uh, this is the most, one of the biggest growing markets in the world. The Middle East are the most efficient travelers. The shortest time to plan, book, arrive, and length to stay. They see something, they book, they arrive, they go. They book everything online, and they use mainly regional OTAs to, to book. So if you're looking for the Middle East for potential travelers, that's some information about it. So that's just a good global overview. Now we're going to get specifically uh, into uh, mountain data. I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Bill O'Brider, to take you through some of the stats that we pulled for the mountain towns. Bill, take it away. Thanks, Ted. And I'm going to shut off my video to conserve some bandwidth as I share all this data. Can you all see my screen? Okay, cool. Um, cool. Thanks, Ted. Um, I wanted to start out by showing some of the bad news and getting it out of the way. Uh, then I'm gonna move into some positive trends and some specific destination inf information. There is hope, I promise. Um, and it's really not that far off. Um, so first, the bad news. Uh, we're gonna click on this right here and go into the bad news. Um, April and May were just awful. I was uh, on a plane from Boston to Denver on Tuesday. It was the only Southwest Airlines nonstop from Boston that day. Typically, they're sold out. Typically, there's four flights a day, and there were 30 people on my plane. Reductions in flight capacity and traveler hesitancy to fly for safety and financial pressure this summer are going to make road trip 
and drive market travel, a key for summer business. Again, April and May bookings have been just terrible for summer. We pulled some data through uh, May 20th and things look pretty bleak for summer bookings and demand as a whole for, uh, versus 2019. Um, there were some, was some last minute demand that came in for Memorial Day weekend and that'll be a trend that we're gonna take a look at and investigate further. Overall, the fall advance bookings in May awful, uh, also looked awful uh, from a year over year perspective. So bad that I was hoping to see some traction for you know, the peak of the peak season. But unfortunately, May bookings for uh, peak winter season are way down too. Usually there's a demand this far out because of inventory scarcity, prioritizing of schedule over trip cost, uh, and honestly, rich people wanted to go away while they're off of, on vacation. But that, that's just not so at this point. Um, so I thought maybe this is just for U.S. ski destinations and the, and the impact that COVID has had on the United States compared to other markets. Unfortunately, no. Uh, peak, uh, the same peak winter travel trends appeared for the Alps. Uh, May has just been an awful month of bookings, but thankfully in a few days it's going to be over. Um, but travel will return, and there really is good news in the data if you look. Uh, summer and fall aren't lost for good, and there's some pockets. Um, this, is, this is why I say that. Taking a look at advanced uh, travel bookings for uh, US over the past couple of weeks, we looked at week-to-week uh, -week bookings for future travel. For the last six weeks, you'll see that year-over-year uh, -year increases, or year-over-year -year de decreases have actually subsided and booking, um, booking uh, growth has increased for the past six weeks straight. We expect that to increase uh, next week as well. Uh, this chart, I know there's a lot of charts, um, but the, this chart shows uh, family travel bookings by advanced travel window, which is indexed. Um, the left half of the screen you can see is uh, normal travel be, uh, be, uh, demand pre-shutdown. The pink line at the top measures the zero to 14 a day, uh, 14 day advance purchase, which are basically your last minute trips. The U.S. showed strong demand uh, for last minute travel for Memorial Day, as you can see in the spike on the right. These holiday trips are usually booked well in advance because of inventory scarcity, and you rarely see this type of last minute booking trend for a holiday. This trend was as of uh, Sunday. You can see where those last minute Memorial Day hotel trips lie. As of yesterday, I pulled another one, and you'll see the difference in how going back and forth, the uh, advanced booking for further out, you'll see the uh, uh, other colors of, on the chart below, um, you'll see that they are slower to recover of uh, advanced bookings, 15 to 30 days, 30 to 60, uh, 60 to 90 and 90 plus. Once we got past Memorial Day, you'll see that those uh, advanced bookings increased, especially for the 15 to 30 day and the 31 to 60 day. That's going to start targeting people that are searching to travel for late June into July and into August. So that's a good trend. That's a positive trend for family travel. Let's pick it up. Um, if we look at uh, solo couples and, and uh, uh, solo travelers and couple leisure travel uh, for hotel, pretty much the same thing. You're going to see that the uh, last minute uh, travel from Memorial Day weekend as of May 24th, you do see that spike in last minute Memorial Day travel, but you don't see much of recovery in advanced travel, uh, which are the other uh, color uh, on the chart below. But as of yesterday, you see a slight uptick. It's trending up for advanced travel, which means that uh, bookings for uh, July and August should start filling in. So more good news for uh, both leisure travel, uh, for souls, travelers, and couples, as well as families. Um, if we look at the United States, this is looking at uh, advanced purchase. So this is looking at uh, future travel weeks and the search demand for those weeks uh, as of now. The uh, Purple bar shows cumulative searches for people that are searching for travel during those, during those weeks. And as you can expect, the further out you go, the less search demand there is. But you do see spikes. Um, you know, at Adara, we're tracking closely how the travel demand over the next 20 weeks is going to fill in, specifically for a uh, holiday. We're going to take a look at July 4th. We're going to watch that slowly fill in now that we've gotten past Memorial Day. And we hope to see uh, some of the substantial last minute bumps in demand like we did see for Memorial Day for July 4th. And we're also gonna look at that for Labor Day. Labor Day look at, is like it's trending uh, up. You know, it's uh, right now it's about 25% down year over year for search demand. 
that's not too bad. And we'll get into what does a new uh, KPI and benchmark look like in this new world, uh, especially for summer and fall travel. So that's for the U.S. as a whole. Let's talk about some how mountain travel, uh, mountain travelers, are, or mountain travel is pacing as well. So I picked a few. Oh, sorry. So I picked a few destinations in the Rockies. Uh, I've looked at New England and I looked at Europe to take a look at booking trends and demand. You know, you can reach out to us at the end of this webinar. We'll give our uh, contact information and we can set up a time with one of our advisors to go over what does pacing look like for your destination and and what is the uh, what is the data show on on recovery. Uh, happy to happy to help you all out. First, we took a look at Colorado, where we see the most travel search demand for a mountain state. Because Denver is such a massive uh, destination for business and convention travel, and that's woven into this, um, Colorado results match fairly closely with the US. Right now, business travel is down, and convention travel is literally non-existent. Uh, most of the con uh, conventions uh, for at least the foreseeable future and into fall have been canceled. Um, so again, Colorado results do match fairly closely with U.S. as far as search and booking demand. When we look at the 20-week forecast, same sort of thing. Uh, right now, it's uh, down about 50% on average year over year uh, by week through August. But do expect a big change uh, for this week. Restaurants in Colorado opened on Wednesday. I was able to get a steak dinner at a sit-down restaurant with a, with a waitress and didn't have to do dishes that night. Where this extends to the uh, tourism community is now you can eat out when you're going on an overnight trip rather than taking out and sitting in a hotel room or on the side of the road. Um, what we're also looking at, you see this green line here? As we look towards the end of the summer, we, we're looking for that recovery. And um, this green line uh, denotes a decrease of 25% year over year. That should be a new benchmark of success. I believe that you know most of the mountain destinations and hotels and resorts on this call would deem 50, uh, 25 percent decrease as a success for the summer and for fall business uh, compared to where we stand right now. And so um, we also have that uh, the last minute holiday travel potential that should pick up for July 4th, Labor Day, and perhaps the rest of the summer. So that's still a, a, a shining star. Compared to Colorado as a whole, take a look at Vail. You know, Vail not having the huge convention and uh, more of a leisure travel destination, take a look at Ju June short-term demand. They're only down about 30% uh, in search demand year over year for next week, uh, compared to a nearly 70% decrease statewide. Um, you'll also see, that's that one. You'll also see July 4th and uh, late summer um, in late August and September also have demand spikes. And here, the week of September 14th shows flat search demand year over year. Um, in addition to this, Vail just announced that they're going to be opening lift services at the resorts for the summer, though they didn't give a date. That should help the mountain communities uh, that they're located in with advanced bookings as customers see the reopening happen and are more, uh, are more apt to, to uh, convert. Right down the road, take a look at Breckenridge and how it does differ a bit from Vail. Um, First check out next week, again, they're only down 25% year over year compared to nearly 70% uh, decrease statewide for uh, search demand uh, for travel to Breckenridge. You know, there's, there's more uh, recovery and demand starting for Labor Day as well. You know, and fall doesn't look too awful. You know, again, that 25%, if we can hold firm with that 25% year over year decrease, that's a win at this point. You know, I just saw last night that, um, that New Mexico's uh, governor's putting a uh, putting a uh, uh, hold on 50% of the room inventory for New Mexico hotels. Hopefully that doesn't make uh, make its way to all destinations for mountain travel, but you know, they, they'd be real happy with a 25% year over year decrease considering they're gonna lose about half their hotel inventory. Uh, looking at Utah, going west to Utah, they have a, a higher leisure travel percentage than Colorado generally. Uh, so the bookings uh, here seem quicker to recover, both for search demand uh, and bookings over the last six weeks specific, uh, pacing much better than the rest of the United States. Um, when looking at the pacing, uh, Utah, again, is faring, faring a little bit better than Colorado. And remember, there's still an opportunity for last minute holiday travel potential um, as uh, feeder markets start opening up and people start to travel again. Now look at this compared to Park City which is pacing substantially better than Utah as a state. Look at next week. 
Next week's almost flat in search demand with a huge bump in search, uh, searches for travel that week. Um, huge spike for July 4th in search demand. And look at, look at August. Now, this is a little bit misleading because um, uh, Labor Day shifted back a week. But even looking at the, um, at the average between these two weeks, that 25% number looks like it's going to hold true for, uh, August, uh, for August into September. For, uh, for Park City, so great news there for them. On the other hand, uh, my home state in New Hampshire, um, they're a heavy drive market for Massachusetts, Connecticut, or Rhode Island. And you see some uh, recovery and search demand here in bookings, um, you know, but the problem is in New Hampshire is that uh, they're gonna be very slow to recover uh, for uh, June, July, and even into uh, parts of August because of the governor's uh, stay at home 2.0. Um, in New Hampshire, they have not shut down the borders, but the governor has restricted activities like golf, state parks, and, and other outdoor activities only to New Hampshire residents um, to try to discourage uh, customers coming in for Massachusetts and Connecticut. They were hit, as you know, really hard with COVID, and so regulations had to be put in place to discourage inbound travel, but constitutionally, they couldn't shut down the borders. Um, Maine, on the other hand, is still under a 14-day mandatory uh, uh, quarantine. So as these uh, restrictions get lifted, that's, that's the only way that they're going to be able to recover for the summer. Uh, North Conway is the biggest um, uh, mountain destination in New Hampshire, and they are faring a little bit better um, than the rest of the state, but it's still, still tough. You know, and it, it's going to be real interesting to see, again, how these restrictions are lifted in the next few weeks, how the drive market returns. Hopefully that drive market can return in time to save at least a portion of the summer. Um, you know, especially for Maine, um, you know, their, their mountains are, are going to be hurt uh, for June, July, and maybe into August, as well as their coastal communities that they thrive on that basically bring them through uh, from a tax revenue perspective. So for economic survival, they're going to have to open up at some point. Um, also took a look at Switzerland. You saw the stats earlier on what may look like for them. Um, in Europe, the, the search demand just hasn't recovered very well. Um, you know, they're, they're, there's not a huge uh, U-shaped recovery in search demand uh, week to week. Uh, bookings are slightly up, but it's just not there yet. You know, um, they are seeing a lot of last minute searches, um, but it, again, compared to last year, it's just, it's just not looking too good right now. But here at Adar, we're going to continue to monitor these week to week. Uh, a lot of the information is available on our website. Um, we, we update a lot of this week to week. Um, and so, uh, again, we're, we're happy to um, investigate your destination if you reach out to us. Um, one more thing on a, to end on a positive note here from a data perspective, you know, pent up demand is real. Um, I'm here in Colorado this week. Um, I've, uh, I've put in for, uh, for uh, the lottery to get uh, a couple more days in, hopefully at A Basin, but got the note that um, I, I couldn't go yesterday. So again, today I'll be putting in, and if there's anybody on the call that can help me out, I'd appreciate it because I need one more day in. Um, so that's good news. Uh, the demand for, for ski is still there. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of silver linings for mountain travel. It's an outdoor sport. Um, it's uh, it's uh, it's a uh, great opportunity for family travel um, and you know wide open spaces we're seeing across the board not just with mountain travel um, are going to be key for uh, summer and into fall uh, for uh, travel recovery. Okay um, that's it for the charts and data and I think that will go into a Q&A. Great thanks so much Bill and Ted really uh, appreciate all of that that data. Um, so now I, I, I want to ask you guys a couple of questions. We've got some questions from the audience, um, but you've just presented us with a, a ton of information. What are the uh, pieces of data that, that are most important if, if people are going to look at just one piece of data? What should they be looking at um, within the industry to inform their decisions? Oh, you go yeah. first on your end. I'll give you my opinion on what I think is important too. Sure. I mean, the search demand is really important because it measures a consumer's willingness to travel. Um, that's the most important thing. You know, we're tracking that um, at the national level um, on a day-to-day -day basis on, on our website at, at adara.com uh, under the COVID resource tracker. Um, and 
that, that search demand and the feeder market demand is going to be really important. Feeder markets are going to be extremely important because a lot are still shut down. Um, so, you know, we look at that as well. Um, and we're also looking at the advanced booking windows and how the uh, short term, medium term and long term advanced bookings are coming back. Um, we're looking at um, business versus leisure. We're looking at uh, family versus solo and couple. Um, and so really the, the search demand as it returns is going to be extremely important. That's, that's I, I want to clarify what search demand. I've seen some of the questions in the Q&A and some of the comments. When we're saying search, these are actual searches within the platforms of our data partners platforms. Okay, this is not Google search or any of that type of search. This is somebody going on American Airlines and searching for flights or somebody going on to Marriott and searching for a hotel. So that's why the search demand is important. And I, I will agree with Bill. Search is interest as an intent. Um, that means that they're looking. Yes, a lot of people are quarantined up and they're searching a lot, but that's fine. That means that they're dreaming and wanting to do stuff. So I think the search information is very important. Booking information, I think past behaviors are important. Remember we talked about sensitivity? Colorado is going to market to somebody differently than if they know is a frequent traveler to Colorado. That's a lot more like, hey, come back, everything's cool, compared to maybe a family that's never been that's looking to do something different this year. That's a different messaging. So I, I think past booking behaviors is also very important. Yeah. I mean, search demand is also, again, the willingness to travel and the, and the dreaming, but a lot of the, um, a lot of the barriers that are put in place for travelers right now are artificial or regulatory or governmental, right? I mean, there's, there's restrictions on having me go ski today. Even there's plenty of room at uh, a base and plenty of snow. Um, you know, so my, my intent is there. I want to go, but I'm restricted from going. Um, and it's important to engage customers, you know, as they show intent. So when those restrictions are lifted, they can pull the trigger. You know, again, in Colorado, the big deal of opening up restaurants, that's a big deal. Um, you know, and we're going to look at search demand for Colorado next week and see if that lifting of that artificial restriction is going to help that search demand translate into bookings. We are tracking both bookings and search demand. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks for clarifying. Uh, uh, that. To answer one of the other questions right on this with the coronavirus waiver, the other thing on search demand is, the way that our data works is we have Marriott data, for example, and a lot of the big uh, big boxes on uh, on ski resort are Marriott properties or in ski towns. Right. Um, if you have a waiver, you know you're you're going to be searching for a replacement trip on, for that waiver. But a lot of the times, those waivers have to be made by making a phone-in purchase, and we're not able to measure that purchase. Right. They're going to be searching for dates to travel and what those uh, look like for redemption. But a lot, of the, a lot of the time, they're going to have to call the hotel or call Marriott's reservation number to make that booking. And so we're not tracking that actual booking if it's made that way. So with all of, all of the data that you guys capture, what are you, you utilizing to um, consult with your clients? And, and what are you telling them? And in what ways can they use this information and this data that you've just presented here? Um, well, I think the questions that we that I said before that, that we always get, when do we go to market, where do we market, and what do we market with? And so the biggest part of the data is we're showing if we're, you start seeing that inflection point of people are starting to search and book, I think that tells you maybe when you can start placing some media out there, even if it's just in your own channels, but then maybe some paid. And Bill, you're starting to see a lot more paid media come out there, right, with some of the destinations. So right. that's when the data there thing that I, is really important is the where. If you're starting to see search and booking intent from certain regions that you haven't seen before, that's great. That tells you new markets. Let me give you an example. Um, London, there's a Pixel on London site and Adara Pixel, and we can track and see all the different countries and cities in the world that are searching to book travel into London. They found five out of their top 20 cities in markets that they've never marketed to. Korea, you know, some other countries like Korea and whatnot. And they're like, wow, we didn't know that. There's a different demand out there. So that's what we would look for where they're coming from and then and uh what time and when to actually put the media out there if you can start tracking your actual creative and putting pixels on certain creative it's a family ad with the people jumping in the air or if it's restaurants and people finally wanting to go out dining or craft beer or something track that and see what actually resonates so that's how you can use the data for those three rigs and so you, Ted, had mentioned earlier that we're going to be judged a lot now by how sensitive we are and how aggressive we are in, in marketing. Right. Where do you think that that balance lies? Um, that's a tough one. Uh, I, I, I think the sensitive, you know, it's, we're kind of getting a little bit past it. And I think it's time to be a little bit more aggressive. And, and I just, 
I don't think you can be too sensitive. I mean, you could also be like, because put it this way, I'm just letting you know, people are going after our market share. And I've worked in Europe for the past three years. They're going after the United States market share. So they're not being real sensitive. They're going after it. I, I think you have to really go with what who you know is searching and booking into your regions and, and serving up advertising. I, I would be a little less sensitive now. I, I think your messaging obviously would be sensitive, but I, I'm, I think it's okay to start putting some ads out there. I really what do. What we're seeing is uh, a lot of the destinations that are starting to target um, travelers again, they're looking at people that are showing intent. Those, tra those people that are showing in their intent are raising their hands saying, I'm interested in going somewhere. They're not scared to travel. I think that the times of broad-based mass reach is, is, is over for now. I think that people have to target people, again, that are raising their hands. There's been some interest in targeting travelers that are confirmed and haven't trapped. They're confirmed to travel but haven't arrived yet, being able to showcase to that customer what the rules and regulations are, are going to are going to make sure that that customer follows those rules and regulations when they come to the destination. And that's going to make sure that your, your locals aren't seeing huge crowds, your locals aren't seeing uh, dangerous behavior, if those travelers know what the rules and what their expectations of them are in advance before they come. Um, one of the other things that we're doing is we're targeting uh, advertising by travel date. So, you know, if you, if you only want to target travelers with a fall message for people that are searching for travel after Labor Day, we can do that and not have to target people that are searching close in. Yeah, um, basically we say uh, it's kind of like using a, a, a rifle instead of a shotgun. I mean, if you really know that these people are searching, then you can, hey, you reached out to me. I'm reaching out to you. It, it's just, I, I think you can be very specific on who you market to. Yeah. But I think that again, sharing, sharing what the rules and regulations are for travel. So people can expect that, first of all, people that are scared of, of um, you know, catching a disease or a, or a virus, they can be put at ease because of the regulations that are being put in place. They're more apt to consider it. Um, and again, the local sentiment is gonna be extremely important. Are they gonna wanna have customers coming to my destination and, and not following the rules that we have in our, in our community? And so, you know, again, messaging to that customer about the rules that are in place, both before the purchase and before the arrival are extremely important right now. Like there's a question that came up, like, what does this answer the question about to ski or not to ski? What we're saying is, what, where are they coming to the mountain destinations for? Is it, to, is it going to be fall time hiking and, and doing that? Or is it going to be summertime travel? We're saying that you can start tracking those creative executions based on if they've come in the winter before, are they coming for skiing or are they not coming for skiing? Are they going to the beach and seeing if you're losing customers to certain regions? That's what we're saying. I mean, I, are they going to come for skiing? Are they coming for other reasons? Are they coming at a different time of year? Because your traveler is going to change a little bit now. And you don't know if, if they're Bill, that'll do everything he can to get on the mountain compared to somebody that just wants to get away. Yeah. Um, the last question that came up about wording on a waiver, um, about whether um, you, about the contagious virus that you can still catch it. Obviously, if you're at a ski resort, that's, again, that's possible. You can catch any disease really at any given time from a, from a virus perspective. Uh, a lot of that's going to fall under the same general waiver requirements of, uh, of uh, having no snow, right? I mean, if you're booking, if you book a hotel and there's no snow and the lifts aren't running, you know, the same thing would be in place. Um, so, you know, the, the putting it on the, on your waiver that, you know, if you catch a virus, you can't sue. I think there's gonna be some legislation coming out about that, that if you catch, it's nobody's fault. It's a, um, if, if you catch a, a virus, um, but as far as the cancellation, that should be a fall within the same type of cancellation clauses, uh, weather. So I want to go back to something, Bill, that, that you had mentioned in one of your previous answers and also on all the, the data that you showed us, there were, you know, calculations week by week. This is, as we know, a very fast uh, moving situation and rapidly changing situation. Uh, what are the trends that you're seeing that are changing week by week and um, how is that, you know, impacting your recommendations? Sure. You know, the last minute holiday travel usually isn't a thing. You know, Memorial Day, you know, a lot of the Memorial Day travel was beach related um, as some of the southern, um, the southeast beaches, some of the Gulf Coast beaches opened and to some extent, some of the California beaches opened um, at, at a real limited extent. Um, and those destinations were up. They, they had a good last minute push. Usually you don't have any inventory left for Memorial Day. You, you rarely have inventory left for uh, vacation destinations for July 4th and Labor Day. Um, so, you know, with inventory available, you are going to see people that are going to be last minute and they're going to fill in last minute where normally that doesn't happen. 
Um, you know, as we get to more of these states opening up and a lot of these regulations being being lifted and people are able to freely travel again, you know, again, that 25% decrease threshold, I, again, everybody in, in travel right now would accept that for summer and fall as a win if they were down 25% year over year. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that we're looking at right now. There is going to be a decrease uh, this year. Um, it's an artificial decrease that's put on by, by regulation and, um, and, and fear um, from, uh, from the virus, and it's rightfully so. Um, but a lot of that will continue back, and not all of it will return. You know, there's always people that were afraid to get on an airplane. There always was a segment of that population. That segment has increased. There's Here's another good piece of good news that we're seeing, too. Yes, our last-minute travel, but we're also seeing the longer length of stay. Yeah. Okay. So last minute travel used to be, you know, two to three days. Hey, let's go some for, for a whim on a weekend. Now, I mean, if, you know, you and your spouse can both remote from a cabin somewhere and the kids are remote in school or out of school, you can go for a week or two weeks. Everyone missed their spring break. People are missing their summer. So we're seeing extended length of stay. So it, the, the last minute travel bits are no longer three days. We're looking at seven or eight days, which is great news, I think. So that you bring up a great point there. And how do you, uh, how do you see that affecting the uh, rental market as well as um, the hotel market and, and the two potentially, you know, merging to those extended stay uh, audiences? Well, I mean, with people being able to work remote more, I mean, a lot of the, especially in major feeder markets, you know, you look at feeder markets for, for uh, West Coast uh, or uh, mountain destinations, a lot of those feeder markets for, uh, for them are San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, um, uh, Dallas, Houston, Atlanta, you know, big metro centers. A lot of the big businesses, big companies in those areas are allowing remote employment through the end of the year or in the next year. Some of them are going to be permanent, that you'll be able to work remote permanently. And so that allows, it opens up the schedule. It opens up the schedule for midweek travel. The customers aren't restricted to long weekends anymore. Um, and so if they're staying in for a longer period of time, I think there's a big opportunity for, um, for a vacation rental and longer length of stay. Agreed. I, the blending with hotels is going to be the interesting thing. You're right. I, I'm going to full disclosure here. We're, I'm, I'm on the Cape. We just moved, I moved back from London just Monday and we were one of 23 people on a Dreamliner flight too. We had the whole place to ourselves. It was weird. And we, we were renting, I was going to stay at a Hampton Inn and Suites in Hyannis and then an Airbnb, they just released some restrictions came up and I'm like, I, I want a little space. So I did that and I'm a Hilton Honors member. And I was like, I want some space because they told me that there were desks and a printer and everything else in this house. I was like, that's great. I can actually remote work from here. And I, I could have done it at the Hampton as well, but it, it changed my booking behavior by that. Yeah, that'll really help the singles, uh, single travel, a couple travel, um, tra travelers with small children. It'll be interesting to see some of the feeder markets, what happens with schools as we get into fall. Will, fall, will schools be remote for fall? We just, some of these variables, we just don't know yet. Right. And as those variables become more and more apparent, we're going to see that how that impacts the search and purchase behavior on pace uh, for a lot of these destinations. And here at Adara, that's what we're really analyzing week to week. So, Ted, obviously this Airbnb was able to capitalize on its, you know, office space for you. How can the mountain destinations capitalize on, on some of their uniqueness in this situation and, and highlight their uniqueness? Oh, I think that's a huge opportunity for the mountain destinations right now. I mean, you... People are going to be outside. I mean, there's the fresh air. There's, there's that. And you, um, there's so much... The mountains huge. I want to go first. So I just need to capitalize on that and not be sensitive. I think it's, you can almost do it on deep things. So I think we're we're losing you a little bit, Ted. I think you're you're cutting out a bit. But I would own what you have and own the fact that you can be that way. Did you lose me? It says poor internet connection. Yeah, yeah we, we did just lose you for a bit. Um, so if you don't mind repeating your answer to that. I say there's a big opportunity that I think the mountain destination should go ahead and own is that there is space, there is that, you can do these things. Um, you're not all crammed together maybe in, in a big or a hotel. I know some of the resorts might have that, but I still think that the resorts could space people out, you know, every other room, those kind of things. I think that's great. I would embrace that and own that. And the other thing, the seasonality. There's a seasonality thing. We've all wanted people to come in May and June and then October. 
Well, guess what? You're going to get people in seasons that you didn't used to get them. And I would embrace that and maybe change some of your creative and change some of your drive market strategies and really try to get people in those shoulder seasons, develop a relationship with those people. That, that, that's what I would do. Great. I think that makes uh, a lot. There was, a, there was a note on the chat that I wanted to address about uh, ski pass sales. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a Vail uh, Epic Pass holder. Um, the, uh, I, got, I got enough days in that I'm going to get a little bit of a dis, uh, discount, but not a huge discount for next year. You know, that the, uh, the, uh, they, they extended the deadline uh, for renewal. Um, you know, but there's a huge incentive for me to, to renew next year. There was another question on this about, you know, if there's a limited supply, will the, will the lift tickets go up to $300? Not if you're a pass holder. Um, you know, getting a reservation is going to be maybe something that a lot of the destinations or the resorts are going to look at next year. You have to make sure that you have a, a lift ticket for that day in advance. Even if you're a pass holder, you, you have to have a reservation slot, but you won't pay that fee. You know, right now, if you go to Breckenridge or Vail, it's almost $200 a day for a weekend single day ticket. Um, you know, I pay a little over $600 for the season. And so there's going to be a huge push for um, for those destinate for those resorts to to get that season pass, um, and there's going to be a huge financial incentive to the customer um, to to buy one in advance. So I I want to shift focus. Thank you for answering the questions that are, are coming in live, and feel free uh, to our audience to continue to submit those questions. Um, but I want to shift the focus. We have a global audience with MTS. And so, Ted, you had shared some, some data from all over the world uh, that was prior to the COVID-19 situation. Um, but what, what are some of the things that we can learn from what's happening um, you know, th throughout the world right now and, and their kind of path to recovery? Okay, um, I've said this, and I said this on a US travel webinar I was on last week. The European destinations, uh, they, maybe in terms of marketing, they're not as technically savvy as the United States ones and don't share as much information, obviously, because Spain's not going to share with um, Italy as much as like North Dakota is going to share with South Dakota. But the European destiny DMOs work with their communities a lot more. The European DMOs work with um, the resorts and, and the taxi unions and everything. They understand the value of tourism. It's a much more of a community type thing that's a focus on the resident more than the traveler. They're working about resident sentiment. They wanna keep the people happy. Um, they do new KPIs like residents versus um, total uh, population. So they do it that way and they try to keep that happiness. We're gonna start seeing that in the United States more now. I think the DMOs in the United States are gonna have more responsibility, more pressure, but more responsibility because now people realize what it's like to not have travel. There was a great quote uh, from Brad Dean from um, Puerto Rico. He said, this is our George Bailey moment meaning like what's a wonderful life like we, we we're getting that moment to now see what it's what what it's like without travel in our industry and it sucks right so the world's going to start understanding that and i think the dmos like scotland's got it right scotland has four pillars under their dmo relocation tourism education and business so what scotland is now you're going to start seeing that so when you see colorado there's going to be focus on business they will work with the ski resorts more it's not just going to be a bed tax there's going to be about six or seven different variables to fund dmos and i think that's what we're going to start seeing i really do and i think it's a great opportunity for us as an industry so you had mentioned kpis and uh what are some of the new kpis that we should be looking at as, as far as, and, and for those who don't know, KPIs, key performance indicators, and, and how should we embrace that KPI change? Um, I, like I said before, you know, the very first slide I think was like, if you don't measure it, you can't improve it. I think you definitely measure the effectiveness of your marketing and advertising um, more so than just clicks and, um, you know, click through rates and website hits and stuff like that. You, you track that down to result into searches and bookies into your destination. The other thing I would look at, and it's a very simple one to do, is total residents versus, um, uh, versus visitors, a ratio and track that monthly and see. The other thing is taxes. We keep tracking bed tax and bed tax all. Look at the entire tax pool of your region that month, first bed tax and see if there's a correlation. That's what you need to do. And, and I would check taxes. So people visiting and resident sentiment, resident sentiment should be in there as well. Are, are your locals happy with the tourism? I lived at Lake of the Ozarks. We used to call tourists FTs, 
because we got so sick of them. But then at the end of September, I was like, God, I'm, I, I need my money back. I, I'm bartending and I'm making 10 bucks a shift. Those are all things that we just need to embrace and show. Those are some of the KPIs. I can send you all a list, Kat, and you can send them to the members. There's about 20 new ones that globally I'm looking at. Great. That, that would be extremely uh, helpful. So we've got about uh, 10 minutes left here. And I, I want to kind of keep the conversation on a, a positive note and, and um, look at some of the silver linings that we've seen out of this. Um, Bill, do you, do you have anything that you guys have seen? That's sure. um, yeah, you know, first of all, the, the big thing that's going to be for summer and mountain travel fits right into this is wide open spaces. Um, tra uh, travel during the summer to cities is going to be really, really tough. You know, it'd be really hard to be a city uh, tourism board uh, right now, where San Francisco, Los Angeles, uh, New York, you know, what have you, as people want to get into wide, wide open spaces. We track every uh, state um, as far as search demand right now. And the ones that are really seeing the, the uh, s smallest decrease, if you will, no one's seeing an increase, but the ones that are seeing the smallest decrease are wide open spaces, Montana, Utah, um, you know, parts of Colorado, um, uh, South and North Dakota, Nebraska. These are wide open spaces where there's not a whole lot of population density that people can get away, they can have a trip, they can experience something new, go for a road trip, um, but not be jam packed with a lot of people. Um, so that's going to be, uh, you know, a big silver lining. Um, you know, again, we talked about the remote learning, the remote working, um, that, that leads itself to help with the possibility for midweek demand um, in, uh, in, in summer, into fall, and maybe even into winter, depending on, you know, the, the company that somebody works for and the age of their children. Um, so being able to get a customer for a longer period of time and, and, and disperse that customer throughout the week, rather than just have huge crowds on weekends and, and light visitation midweek. Um, that's a silver lining, I think. Um, seasonality. Yeah. Seasonality. Like the stay, all that stuff. Yeah. Yep. There's a lot of silver lining. I actually think the biggest silver lining is there's going to be so much more of a focus on travel and being with friends and family and doing that stuff now in the future, more so ever in the past. And I think yep. that's great. And I think there'll be increased pressure. And I've always believe that pressure is a privilege and the more pressure we have on us in the tourism destination and the more in, in the tourism uh, industry is, is better for all of us. Yeah. You know, there's, again, there's, there's, there's a lot more people that are scared to travel. I, I don't think anybody can, can disagree with that from now versus this time last year. Um, there, there's more people that are hesitant to travel, but the other thing is a lot of the destinations, they can set the regulations themselves onto what they feel is safe and uh, a, a good mixture of, of safety. Um, and a, a positive economic um, uh, contributor to, to a destination. Being able to share with prospective travelers what those regulations are in place is gonna make a lot of people feel a lot more easy about traveling. It'll make them feel a lot more receptive to the thought of, of, of leaving their home um, and going on a trip if they can feel that these safety protocols are in place for me and my family. Bill, there's a bunch of questions out there that are going around like, how do we promote ourselves knowing that we have these really loose, you know, cancellation policies and that there's a lot of that going on right now. And seeing if we want to maybe give our advice on what we think. So they're like, well, how do I really want to put money out there in the market? And then they book and then they just cancel because there might be a second wave of stuff. That's a, that's a tough one to answer. I don't know if you had any insight on that that you wanted to give. I'd, I'd rather take the booking. If it has to cancel, that's out of your control. I'd right. rather take the booking. You know, again, the customers have a certain amount of money that they budget towards travel every year. If you can at least claim a reservation of that money, if they cancel because of, of something like that, that's really out of your control. Um, but you know, being able to command that money from a competitive standpoint, make sure that you get a, a piece of it versus a competing destination or competing activity. I think a booking is, is a good thing. You're right. If you don't do it, what, then you don't do it. And then, then you're not getting any booking. So I, I think it's okay to, you know, hey, maybe 30% cancel or only 70% did. I mean, I, and you developed a relationship with somebody that got exposed to your media, they saw, searched your property, checked all the amenities out, saw that you were safe, something happened, they canceled, what do you do? But I, what else do we do? We gotta do something, you know? Yeah, um, there's a note on Idaho. I, Idaho is actually faring really well. Um, when we took a look at um, top uh, destinations for uh, Memorial Day travel, uh, Pocatello and Idaho Springs were in the top five for a uh, year over year growth. So 
again, wide open spaces are doing really well. Montana, uh, Utah, um, Wyoming, um, mountainous Colorado, not, not Denver as much, um, are, are all performing extremely well. Right. And it, even though we saw a decrease in Switzerland, I want to talk to our international DMOs. We're still seeing an increase of bookings and travel into the mountain towns around Europe and everything. They're just maybe not flying there as much. So you're going to see that kind of decrease. And we, we blended those in an aggregate for that report. But we are seeing more and more people just getting out to the countryside and the mountains in Europe. They're just not using the plane. So it's just not showing up on our data. But we are seeing more hotel searches and accommodation searches. And then looking at winter, the other silver lining is, you know, A Basin was able to put together a social distancing um, uh, operation, at least for this week. Again, with limited snow, with three lifts, they were able to do it. It's limited amount of people, but it was a, it was a process that they put in place that was accepted by the town. Um, it was accepted by the, by the, by the state. Um, and ultimately it was accepted by the people who, who signed up um, for at least a chance to, to get it again. They, they may have another 15, 20 days this year. Um, if it's 30 people a day that aren't pass holders that get, it, get in, you know, that's, that's five, 600 people. That's great. Um, but at least they've showed a protocol in place and they've taken steps that may be able to be replicated as we get into uh, the rest of the resorts opening up for ski as we get into winter. So Kat, I'm curious, what are your kind of takeaways from this conversation that you're thinking that are silver linings, takeaways that you can share with the MTS, just because we're reading some, I'm just, what are you gleaning from this that you're thinking, huh, that's positive, that's different, we didn't know that. So uh, I personally uh, think the the idea of the extended stay is really interesting. And as myself, I'm somebody who's, you know, located right outside of Manhattan. My office has told me that I don't have to go back into the office for the, the end of the year. And so I certainly would be somebody who would capitalize on, you know, being able to go somewhere for two weeks and get that midday hike in. And, um, you know, that's something I wouldn't have been able to do previously. And um, I, if, if somebody hadn't told me about that, if somebody wasn't marketing that idea to me, I probably wouldn't have, have come up with it on my own. So I think that's, um, you know, a huge silver lining and something that, that those who are in uh, sales and marketing, you know, listening to this is a, a definitely a big takeaway. So. Right. I, I the, remote office, the remote office thing. If you've got a view from a mountain and that's your remote office, I'd put that out there. Oh, so you have to remote the rest of the year. Would you prefer this view or that view? I think that's the thing that we should put out there more. Yeah. I mean, again, again the, the reluctance to get on airplanes is, is a real deal for the summer. Um, you know, focus on drive market's going to be important. One of the silver linings are if you're a Colorado resort or a Wyoming resort or a Utah resort or Montana or, or uh, New Mexico, um, the drive market, driving to a beach is just not in the cards, right? And so you're really looking at a mountain outdoor type trip, um, which is, it really is a silver line. You're able to get, get a better percentage of that customer because a customer from Denver is less likely to fly to a beach destination. They're more likely to drive this summer. Right. And the news is not going to show a mountain of people like all getting together and look at these cluster of people in the mountain. No, it's not news. They're going to show a bunch of people on a beach being stupid or at the Lake of the Ozark in a pool. Let's be, I, the reason they're not showing mountains on there right now, it's not news not because problem. people are socially distanced and out and doing the outdoors. I think that's a great positive, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're about at time and I don't want to keep people over. So I'm just going to throw your contact information up here so that everyone has that. Um, I know we had some questions on specific areas. And so if anybody wants to reach out to uh, Ted and Bill to get some more information, they're definitely available for that. Um, as, as I mentioned, um, there's going to be a survey at the at the end of this, so make sure you uh, fill that out and, and give us your feedback on today's content. Thank you so much, Ted and Bill, for joining us. We really appreciated all the insights that you and Adara have had for our audience, um, and uh, we we are looking forward to uh, seeing you guys live at next at mm -hmm. our next MTS event. So Sounds good. costume party, <laughs> costume party. We're decking it out. We're driving. We're, 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 you haven't seen anything yet, man. Yep. You guys are always, always known at Adara for a great costume. So thank you. Kat, hey, thanks so much for the opportunity. We will answer the questions online that we see here and everything else. So thank, thank you all for being there. Thanks.
Thank you, everybody. Great. Thanks. Bye, guys.